Oh, I can see there's 15 people there. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Garden Coach Sessions here at Chalet. And um, I, as people sign on and sign on, I do have the chat screen up. So whenever you type in on the chat, I'll be able to see what you're typing. And what we've changed the format. We changed it last week and had a really good response to it. So each week for, for Garden Coach, I'm going to talk about the things you should be concerned with this week. And it's based on the samples. Look at this, all the samples that I get at the information desk and uh, oh I've got some great ones like look at this this is this is a cherry that has shot hole fungus and that's one of the questions that came through so I'm going to talk about those and then I'm going to go through all the questions you can see I have them all lined up here and I have my answers written in and then I have the products with me so I can show you what you need to use okay so um, so we'll go ahead. I see there's 17 people. Um, I did something fun while everyone else is, 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 is logging on here or, or signing in. I got to go up to the Chalet Farm today and um, I was, was the spokesperson for the 10 plants that are being featured for the virtual farm truck um, tomorrow. And they ranged from you know, two wonderful perennials, um, a, you know, a, a gorgeous salvia caradana, an incredible hosta um, called Francie. It's one of the best white edged hostas that is out there and slug resistant because the leaves are so thick, the slugs can't chew through them. And then um, several wonderful trees and, um, and, and, and some excellent shrubs. My favorite, my favorite is a, a, a spirea uh, called birch leaf spirea tor. And tor is the Gaelic term for a mound. And that's, that describes it perfectly. It's a two by three wide and two by three tall and this perfect plant that gets gorgeous white flowers right now and then incredible fall color and you can use it as a specimen plant or it works like a, a workhorse out in the garden like a wonderful hedge so so watch for that and and I'm, i've given my quick take on all those different plants and what you'll do is you'll order them online and then they'll be delivered they'll be brought down to the, the, the retail location and you can designate whether you want to pick your purchase up on Friday or Saturday. So it's a really good, it's a good deal. And you, you get these, these are plants that we have extras up at our farm and we're giving you a value on them. So it's a neat thing to offer that. Everyone loved it when we did farm truck Fridays and people would come and stand and buy off the truck. Um, but now we have to do everything virtually and you know, like today, you know, like today. So, oh good. I've got 25 people out there. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. And um, the first thing I want to talk about is with all the rain that we've had and the warmer weather that we've had, boy, the fungal, the fungal diseases are starting to flourish. And um, the first one that I'm seeing a lot of is anthracnose. And anthracnose is just a fancy name for the disease that causes leaf spots. And you're going to start seeing them all over the place. You're going to see them on, um, on, 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 on maples, ashes, oaks, and it's a leaf spot disease that the fungus gets into the baby leaves before the waxy cuticle builds on them and it inoculates, the disease gets in and that's what causes disease when the spore inoculates it. And then the lesions show up four to six weeks later. And so once you start seeing those spots, it's almost too late, you can't protect. But, but I still would love to warn everybody to get out there. Oh my gosh, did I not bring that? I didn't bring um, I didn't bring my Immunox fungicide. Immunox is the best fungicide. You spray it; it comes in a spray bottle. It also comes in a concentrate, and you spray it on the leaves. It's absorbed into the leaves. It's what we call translaminar systemic. So one surface is called a lamin, and it, it's pulled from one lamin to the other lamin through all the cells, and it stays in for 14 days, even if it rains out there. So it's my favorite for things like. Um, roses for black spot and powdery mildew and uh, peonies for the rhizoctonia stem blight and the peony measles that are going to show up later in the season. Um, things like apple scab on any of the rosaceae family of plants and uh, let me where are my notes here also. Um, yeah, okay. Those are the those are the, the the main ones. Now I mentioned just at the beginning 
that this is a really cool sample. And there was one of the questions that came through about the cherry tree. And if you would, if you would look at this, see all the holes on it. I'll put it right up close. Ooh, this is really fun. See all those holes on it? The first thing people thinks, think is that an insect did that, had holes. Well, when you look really close, now see this brown, that brown patch right there, right there? Okay, when you look real close, and I'm gonna turn it around to the back side. Okay, see, it's, it's, it's kind of pulling away. And we call this shot hole fungus. So what happens is the fungus makes the lesion, and then, and then as it gets dried out, that, that drops out and then leaves, leaves the hole, like right, you know, right there. And so that we call it shot holes, like someone hit it with buckshot. You can tell I grew up on a farm, can't you? Someone hit it with buckshot and all those holes. And it, it got inoculated about four, four weeks ago when these leaves are baby leaves and, and now it's showing up. So what you wanna do is you wanna spray this plant with either, um, either a copper fungicide or the immunox. If it's an edible cherry, well, you can use immunox because it's cleared for use on fruit trees now. But another good one is, is it's copper fungicide from uh, Bonide. And this is actually called copper soap. It's copper octanoate. And it was produced by a company called Neudorf. See that logo, that little half sunflower and that German name Neudorf? That's the company that does all of the, um, the, um, the earth friendly natural products over in Europe. They don't sell here in the United States because they don't want to mess with the, um, the EPA, but they sell all their active ingredients to the companies that register with the EPA. So when you see that, you'll know it's an earth friendly natural to use. Problem with that though, is you spray it on and it rains, and it washes it off. So you have to run back out and respray every time it rains. So, but take care of those fungal things. Now, um, the next thing are the insects that are showing up. And oh, this one is bad, bad, bad. And this is kind of a gross sample. These leaves came in and they were only half eaten, okay? Now see these things up here at the top? Those are the larvae of the viburnum leaf beetle. They just emerged last weekend. And this sample came in last weekend and they chew, they can, they can strip all of the leaves off of, off of a plant in three to five days. So if you see them, you need to use an, an, an insecticide, a spray on insecticide, so it kills the insects on contact and stays in the foliage. I love this one, the three in one, because this has the insecticide, the fungicide, and also a miticide in it. And this comes in a hose and sprayer. So for plants that are already getting this, you know, you need to get, you need to spray that pretty quickly to control that. When they finish feeding, and they look like, if they're up here, that means they're finished feeding on this. They're getting ready to drop to the ground and pupate, and then they'll stay in the ground for six to eight weeks and come back out as adults, and they'll do the same thing to the new leaves that form through the rest of the summer. Horrible insect just moved into our area five years ago. So be aware if you have viburnums, especially the smooth leaf viburnums. Okay, the other thing you gotta watch out for now are the, the boxwood. And this is boxwood leaf miner that's causing this. And what it looks like, it, it looks like winter damage. It looks like these things all froze. And when you pull them out, you can see that they look yellow. See, so they, look, they look yellow and, and browned out. But if you look really closely, and on the back, you can see little pinholes where the insects, the eggs were laid and they burrowed in. And then these larvae are inside those leaves eating the mesophyll cells in between the two epidermal layers. And then, then when after the winter, it starts drying out. People think it was, it's, it's winter damage. But if you peel this open, you can see the, the insects in there. So now is the time to spray with either a systemic insecticide or you can still drench with one of the systemic drenches, uh, like the um, the the bon, the, um, the bio advanced all in one, oh no, the bio advanced twelve month tree and shrub insecticide, and you measure the height of the shrub, multiply times three. That's the number of ounces you add to a gallon, and then drench it right where the trunk goes into the ground. It's taken up in the plant, stays in for one full year, killing all these insects. So if those adults emerge from another plant mate and fly over to your your plant and lay an egg when those eggs hatch and those larvae chew their way in they're going to ingest that insecticide and it will kill them and protect your plant if they're inside and they pupate and they chew their way out 
they're going to get the insecticide and it'll kill and stop the, the stop the life cycle. So we've got really good tools to protect, you know, protect from that. Now this is and this is one that's been around. I think I've been dealing with this for about ten years now. This is nine bar, and everyone just thinks this is powdery mildew, but um, they get an, another insect. It's called an eryophyid mite. I know that's a big that's that's a mouthful, isn't it? And eryophyid mites are microscopic. You you can't see them, and you I rarely. The only time I've seen a larva in the, the 29 years I've been here it was a really hot day. Someone brought a sample in, and the larva had come out of the um, the, the, the the mound, and I, I saw it under the microscope. But rarely do I see that. Okay, when you're looking at um, nine bark. And oftentimes you see, see, oh, this is perfect. You can see this really well. See those white lesions? And then you can also see kind of a, a mounding, um, you know, a, a center part in there. Okay, what happens is those eryophyid mites spend the winter under the, the, the scales on the stem. When the new leaves open, they crawl out, lay an egg, those eggs hatch, and the, the larva chew their way in. And then as they're, um, as they're uh, um, you know, coming out, it gives a, a, a rough surface for the powdery mildew to attach to. So most people just think this is powdery mildew, but you need to treat for the fungus and the mite. And so that's, this is my favorite again. There's that all in one or the three in one, the insecticide, the fungicide, and the mite control. That will they'll protect against the, the area of fired want mites. So I usually tell people to spray their nine barks just in the spring when the leaves are starting to open before you see the disease. So, but you can, if you see this now, spray now, and then you can prune back the disease parts and then you know get rid of the powdery mildew sample and then also that prevents and kills any of the any of the any of the mites that are in there so they can't they can't come back okay so now enough of that now um all right be careful because we've been so warm and moist and and our soil temperatures have finally gotten above 60 and six, you know 65 is that magic number where slugs are actually going to get active and then they're going to go after the hostas so so you want to get the sluggo down now and these are granules and you all you need this actually this one pound container is enough for a thousand square feet so all you need is one teaspoon every three square feet and sprinkle it around where the hostas are this is made from flour sugar and water with iron phosphate embedded into it the slugs can't resist the flour sugar and water they're attracted to these pellets, and it looks like someone has taken hours breaking uncooked spaghetti apart. I should oh, I should have had some to show you, but but you sprinkle those, and again, one teaspoon, one little teaspoon every three square feet. The slugs can't resist. They crawl, they eat it, and then they ingest that iron phosphate, and what the iron phosphate does is it kills their appetite. So it stops them from causing any more damage, any holes in your hosta, but and it also, they just crawl away and die somewhere. So do this every two weeks, starting now, starting this weekend, you know, or today, you know, this is Wednesday. So, oh no, it's Thursday. Oh my, can you tell I've been working too hard? <laughs> anyway, ev you know, every two weeks, and then also, you know, also do it again starting mid-July, July 15th, August 1st, and August 15th, because after it gets hot and humid, then all the eggs that were laid last year hatch. So, so you want to have your sluggo out there, you know, out there now. Okay, so, all right, ooh, I covered, I covered, oh, at the information win window, chickweed, 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 because we, we warmed up and we had all that wonderful rain. The plants are loving it, and you know, everyone thinks it's a wet, wet year because it broke the record. No, no, no. We had one four-day event where we had over eight inches of rain. Before that, we'd been pretty dry, and with the rain came just at the time that our plants needed it, and they've been soaking it up like crazy, all our trees and our shrubs. Have you noticed how the hostas have almost grown six inches every day? I leave for work, and they're this tall. I go home, and they're this tall. So our, our plants have been loving, absolutely loving that. So, you know, so keep, you know, get the fertilizer back down and around everything and, um, and, and don't worry about, you know, and thinking there's just been too much, you know, too much, too much water. Okay, now, um, oh, I was talking about how this, the weed seeds, because of all that water and the warmer temperatures, 
all the weed seeds are germinating, chickweed galore in the lawns. So if a pre-emergent wasn't put down, and a pre-emergent for a lawn has fertilizer, and it also has like a, the, a, the, a weed killer, and we call it a pre-emergent, it prevents any crabgrass seeds from germinating. And once you see lilacs in bloom, guess what's in bloom out there now? All the lilacs in the landscape. That indicates that our cell temperature is above 55. So that means, you know, that means the crabgrass is germinating right now. So if you didn't get a pre-emergent down, you know, get it down as quickly as you can, because it might, it might help to prevent any of that crabgrass. But all the other weeds are germinating too, and that's what happened. The chickweed really, you know, really germinated. So you need to use chickweed, clover, and oxalis killer. This is the best one. This is actually it's labeled for over 200 in, uh, weeds, and they're inside the label inside here. These are the tuppies, so they have this on the front. But this is this is labeled to kill things like uh, wild violets. You know, wild violets in the lawn. People think they're looking for violets on the label. It's wild violets. So sometimes it's hard to find that. Creeping Charlie, it even says it on the front, kills Creeping Charlie. And so you, you wait till it's not raining and not predicting rain for 24 hours, spray the weeds. And then this is these chemicals that are in here are plant hormones. That's why you can spray it on a lawn and it doesn't kill the grass plants. It only is the hormones that kill broadleaf weeds. So like chickweed, clover, oxalis, creeping charlie, violets. And what this does is it, it's absorbed in and it takes it down and kills it at the root level and the weeds die in five to 10 days. Phenomenal stuff. Now the toughies like creeping charlie, wild violets, you want to spray two weeks in a row. And then the first one just kind of slaps them to get their attention. The second time really kills them. So, you know, wonderful, wonderful. This is, this is the best, the best product to use right now. Okay. So now I got all the, all the, all the emergency alerts going, and now I'm going to, now I'm going to answer all these, all these, all these questions. Okay. So the first one, I'm not going to read people's names if you don't, if you don't mind, but you'll know the question. Okay. How do I know when to water my traditional, not a raised bed uh, or potted garden? Okay, there is a cool rule of thumb. All right, at 75 degrees and cooler, we need, and our landscape plants need one inch of rainfall each week. For every 10 degrees above 75, so if it's 85, guess what we've been the last couple of days, every 10 degrees, you need to add another half inch. So we should be getting an inch and a half of rain. And if we don't get it, then that's when you need to water. So if you're worried about your, you know, your, your vegetable garden, your regular traditional garden, watch the rainfall. And I like to encourage people to have a rain gauge at their own house. And so every time it rains, you see how much rain there is and write it down. I have a notebook in my garage and um, I write it down. And then on my day off, I check to see how much rain we've had, you know, I've had at my house through the week. And if it's not enough, then I run my sprinklers. So that's kind of, that's the rule. It's really easy, you know, to keep track of what you get at your house. Don't rely on what they say they have at O'Hare because you know how spotty our rainfall can be. Okay, great question, great question. Great one to start with. Okay, a few years ago, I had an area that had some gravel on top of it and I converted it into a garden area. Um, okay, uh, okay, okay. Then uh, you've had different results, and different results. Uh, the cucumbers grew well, but zucchini, the zucchinis didn't flower very well and didn't get a, a, a lot of good crops and it didn't produce like you wanted. And so um, the, the, a chalet landscaper suggested uh, using a mulch. And so she you know, used a mulch and topsoil and you, were, you added topsoil and garden soil this year. What else that can I do? Okay. This is, I don't mean to be a, a, a wise guy, but the problem with the zucchinis was the, the, the fact that the last four years, we've gone from wet, cold springs to hot, obscenely hot, dry summers. Uh, like two years ago, I remember it was 89 degrees on the 29th of June. And then by July, my birthday is the 20th. On my birthday, it was 102. Obscene, obscene temperatures. When it gets that hot, all of our flowering plants and especially our vegetables and our vegetable gardens, they stop flowering. And especially zucchinis, especially zucchinis. And the problem with zucchinis is the male flowers open first 
and then the female flowers open. And so the male flowers open, and then if it gets too hot and too dry, they close up, and then it warms back up again, and you've got the female flowers, guess what? No pollinators, and there's no pollen. And so then bees and stuff have to bring it around. So sometimes zucchinis don't do so well. Um, you know, cucumbers aren't quite as fussy like that. So that's why you had good luck with your cucumbers. Um, but so you said, what can you do? And this is my wise guy comment, pray for cooler summers. So we can water as much as we want, but if those temperatures are that high, you know, at production time, it's really gonna impact. And it, and it really affects tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, zucchini. So, you know, so unfortunately, you know, mother nature and weather really dictate a lot of that. So, 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 you know, get them in earlier and, you know, and, and hope that you get them, uh, you, help, you help get them pollinated. Okay, you can also self-pollinate if you can find the male flowers. So, you know, so that, that's, you know, that, that's the catch. That's the catch. Okay, so now, oh, this one, this one I've already answered. I have a weeping cherry tree with lots of holes in the leaves. And it says, what can be done about that? Okay, I talked about the shot hole fungus. That's what you have. And it really showed up. It just showed up just in the last week. And so spray those plants. And the weeping cherry, that's usually, that's usually an ornamental. So you can use um, like Immunox where it's a chemical base and it's great. You spray it on and it stays in for those two weeks and just spray. They say spray three times up to five times in the growing season if, continue, if, if conditions are favoring disease. This year, I'd go ahead and just do five times, you know, and then that way you've got it really protected. But start earlier next year. If you knew you had problems this year, then next year, start spraying a little earlier to protect it. So that's, you know, I, I always talk about protection. You want to protect those plants to keep them from having those problems. Okay, my six hydrangeas that I bought two weeks ago and planted uh, right away look brown and dead. Now I need to ask you this, is it, are they just the flowers? Are the leaves, have the leaves browned out? Now, if it's just the flowers, what happens when you plant a flowering plant, especially when the flowers are on it, the roots grow and the nutrients that go to the plant are the same nutrients that the roots use. So the roots kind of hog all the energy and, and rob Peter to pay Paul. Don't worry, don't worry. Once they get established, the flowers will come back. But now, if it's the leaves that are all brown, that means it got too dry in between waterings. So that means you need to treat any newly plants like intensive care patients. And that means for the first six to eight weeks, because that's how long it takes for the roots to grow from the root ball into the surrounding soil. So for those first six to eight weeks, you need to water them every two days. And that means not just the surrounding soil. Don't set a sprinkler up go with a watering wand and actually water that root ball. You know, put the hose down so you're really soaking the root ball. I've talked about this before on these uh, garden coach sessions where I visually, mentally divide my root balls into quarters. And I take my watering wand and hold it over one quarter, count to five. One, two, three, four, five. Then I move it to the next quarter. One, two, three, four, five. The third quarter, count to five. The fourth quarter, count to five. And do that two times. Then you really are hydrating that root ball because if the roots haven't grown out of the root ball into the surrounding soil, you can have moist soil around. And then if we have warm temperatures and higher winds, the water gets pulled out of the plant and out of the root ball and then you have a dry dry plant and then you can get you can get the drought damage that might be the case so so kind of look at all those that variables about your hydrangeas the other thing and oh dread I didn't bring any um, I love when people use root and grow that's the transplanting solution that has um, it has a, 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 a four four ten three fertilizer the magic number is that middle number that's the phosphorus that's the nutrient for roots and for flowers and 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 what it also has that rooting hormone in it and the rooting hormone is endobacteric acid or iba and when you give that to newly planted plants that, that hormone tells the plant plant i want you to use all the phosphorus to make roots and the plant does it. It's like a well-behaved teenager, Ugh, you know? And so it's just wonderful. So you use that every two weeks for 
three or four times and that takes it through the first six to eight weeks while the roots are forming into the surrounding soil. Really does a good job. And then any extra phosphorus will go to making new flowers. So your hydrangeas, you know, should recover. Okay, now uh, the next thing. Okay, I have a couple of, of tough spots in our landscape uh, that won't grow anything and um, for good reason, because of mature pines. All right, the problem with pines is the shade. And then also the fact that the pines have very surface oriented roots. So they pull all the moisture away from any plants that are you know, planted under them. But you can, you can use really good shade tolerant perennials like epimediums. It's also called bishop's cat. They can tolerate, they're little toughy plants. They can tolerate the competition with surface oriented roots like pines. Uh, other ones are brunera, that's, uh, that's Siberian bug loss. Hostas too are pretty good. Uh, well, you, had a, you have to give them extra water. Haas is like a lot of water. But, um, but you know, go with shade, shade, tolerant, um, you know, perennials, and you, you can really have a, you can have a good luck. Okay, um, how do I take care of voodoo bulbs? Okay, voodoo bulbs need to be watered weekly, and, uh, and then they like a lot of fertilizer, you know, so do that. I have a feeling that that's in a container, or, or, or do you have that out in the garden? I'll have to touch base with you later on that one. Okay, plant skid. And repels all does not seem to stop rabbits from eating, munching on all my plants. Okay, here's the reason why. You probably have a bunch of baby rabbits out there. And baby rabbits, Mother Nature has given them a real benefit. They don't have a sense of smell or taste until they become adolescents. So they will eat through any of these other repellents. So what you need to do is switch to... Uh, it's called liquid fence. Did I bring that? I, yes, I did. Okay, liquid fence dual action. Here it is for rabbits. And this has two different um, irritants for their taste buds and their mouths. Uh, one is cinnamon. They hate cinnamon. And the other is capsaicin. And you spray it on the plants. Do it on a day where it's not raining and it dries. It'll stay on those plants for two months. But to really have a good effect, you spray once a week for the first two weeks and then once every two weeks, and then once a month after that. And this really will do the trick. You'll be amazed. And then once you're out of this bottle, the, 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 the baby rabbit should be adolescence, and then you can go back to use, finish up using your Repelzol and, and your plant skeet. But always have this on hand if you're dealing with rabbits. They just are the worst pests that we have for our landscapes. They do thousands of dollars of damage. I hate rabbits, I hate rabbits. Okay, now, um, Okay, okay. Oh, can you use, oh, can you recommend a fast growing shrub to screen a refuse area? Uh, four foot maximum height, full sun, and it's creekside. Okay, um, they're great evergreens. Uh, the, the, any of the, any of the, the, the vertical use, the, the upright growing use are excellent for that. Um, if, you're, if you don't wanna do, uh, oh, you said full sun. Oh, full sun. Even the arborvitae would be great. Um, you know, the emerald green arborvitae would be wonderful. Um, if you just want to go with like a deciduous, uh, you know, plant, privet, you know, you know, privet hedge, um, ligustrum is the, is the, is the name. That's excellent. It's fast growing and, you know, you know, it will, it will go, you know, it'll get taller. You'll have to prune it to keep it at, at, you know, four foot, but that's an excellent, that's an excellent quick, quick screen. Okay. Um, oh, whoever said I just want to listen this time. Thank you. That's really cool. I, I like that. Okay. I have two black walnut trees in my backyard. What plants tolerate these? You know what? We've got a wonderful handout and I've got your name and your email uh, associated with this. I'm going to send you that handout uh, for the, uh, it's called Juglens. Juglens is the chemical that's in the roots of the black walnuts. And when, and it, it's, 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 it's secreted out of the roots and it can damage the other, the roots of, a, you know, plants that are planted in that root zone. And so you want plants that are resistant to juglans, juglans, okay? So it's juglans resistance. So I'll send you that and, and, because there's a whole neat list. It's amazing, you know, what actually survives that. Okay, and oh, what is Jennifer's favorite top dressing for flower beds? Uh, I use cotton burr compost as a cell amendment, but it seems a bit chunky. If you don't like the texture of the cotton burr, I like, that's my favorite. I, I like to mulch with that and amend with that. But if you like something that's a little more refined, the chalet leaf mulch is just gorgeous. It's just elegant. And that's Tony Fulmer's favorite. You know, so I, I would, you know, I would, I would really highly recommend that. Now, planting tomatoes and other veggies in large pots is a lovely concept, but how, uh oh, 
how uh, they cut off. How does it in drowning, you know, how do you prevent drowning in heavy downpours? Well, you just have to make sure those pots have drainage. You know, if you have drainage, it shouldn't be a problem at all. And, um, and, and they'll drain out. They, they should be fine. And, and they don't mind getting a good drink of water, every, every, you know, every now and again. Okay, is leaf mulch the best type of mulch to use if you, want, if you also want to improve your mostly clay soil? Well, leaf mulch is good, but I was talking about the, the cotton burr compost. That is really the best one to improve clay soils but you know you need to use another product too and uh, it's in a bag that uh, I think it's I, I think it's about 40 pounds and it's called uh, it's from the Espoma company and it's called clay soil perfecter because you want to have perfect perfect soil and they look like a three-quarter you uh, know three-eighths of an inch um, pebbles that they look like small lava rock because there are little holes in them. And you wanna, you wanna spread two inches over the surface of, of, of that garden and dig it into the top you know, six to eight inches. And what's great, what's great, one of those bags would improve a 25 square foot area, it's five by five. Or if you're just planting new plants, you put that in the soil underneath and fill it with the backfill. And it is wonderful because it will absorb excess moisture out of, in the soil, in the heavy clay soil. It aerates the, he the heavy clay soil. But I like to use that with the cotton burr compost so it gives you that organic matter. Man, it really improves heavy clay soil. That's the best thing to do. So it's the Espoma Clay Soil Perfector plus cotton burr compost. Now the cool thing about the clay soil perfector is it never breaks down. Once you add it, it stays in the soil. But what's nice to do is just always, every season, every spring and every fall, top dress with more of that organic um, 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 compost like cotton burr or leaf mulch. And then all the insects, the, the cell insects and the earthworms help bring it down and, and, and air, you know, bring it through. And, and, and then you, it really improves your soil, very much so. Okay, recommend blueberries and raspberries for susceptible growing on the North Shore. Do you carry them? Oh, we do, we do. There, it's the, it's, oh, what do they call it? They call it uh, um, bush, barrel and bush brand. And they're dwarfs, they're dwarf blueberries and dwarf raspberries. And you can plant them. Um, I think we had, and we have, four different varieties of the blueberries, and I think only two of the raspberries. And they are wonderful because they're small little plants. They, they, they're, they're dwarf plants, but they produce uh, real-sized fruit. Oh, excellent. Keep them well-watered and well-fertilized, and you will have tons of yummy. I, I have a great recipe. If anybody wants it, you can um, email me and say, send me the recipe for your famous straw raspberry tart. I have a, uh, you can do a raspberry tart or a strawberry tart. I like the raspberry. Anyway, um, so anyway, okay. I just added some sod to a small area of my yard, uh, four by five feet. Could you please give some tips for successful tips on how to um, keep that happy? Okay, now I'm hoping, hoping, hoping it's a sunny area because there's no such thing as shade grown sod. So you can get a quick cover with sod and if it's too shady you'll need to overseed with a shade tolerant grass seed to make to keep it going and keep it going. But the, the secret is to keep it moist. Keep it moist for the first um, I would say the first four to six weeks. So you want the roots to grow into the soil underneath. That's called knitting in. You want the roots to knit into the soil underneath. One of the things that can, can be really dangerous with sod is the edges can to curl up and then they dry out. So go in and walk on your sod. I know it sounds awful, doesn't it? But walk on it. So you're really making sure there's contact with the bottom of the, the root the root area and the soil and just step on those edges so that it keeps them down on the ground. They'll tend to lift up. And then you water, you know, lightly every day. So you want to keep it the consistency of a, of a damp sponge. You know, so when you, you know, when you squish on it, you know, you, you push on it, it feels kind of squishy, but do that. And, and then don't forget to keep fertilizing it. And then one of the best things you can do if you've got a sodded lawn, is to core aerate it at the end of the summer. What that does is that that helps bring the plugs up and and introduces the mud, the soil down below up to the mother soil that the sod is growing in. And it's like shaking hands, they get introduced. Oh, nice to meet you, now I can grow into you. And so by doing that, you core aerate and it, you open up um, plugs down so that you get more oxygen and more fertilizer down and the roots will grow deeper and you'll get a really well-established lawn that way. 
Okay, the next one. Um, okay, okay. The best time for watering vegetable, the vegetable garden, and how to keep it, how to keep the deer and the rabbits out. Well, the best time is in the morning. You want your plants nice and hydrated to get through the heat of the day and to do all the jobs they were, they're going to do, like making flowers or making flowers to make fruit and, and or to make those tomatoes. So the best time is to you know water them early in the morning so that the foliage dries off before they go to bed at night so you don't have as much problem with any of the diseases, especially the powdery mildews when they're hot and humid. Um, but if you can't, don't think that it's not good to water. Anytime the, the garden needs water, water it. So if you get home late from work and it needs water, water it. And, you know, and try not to make that the habit of watering all the time because then you make it more susceptible to those fungal diseases when the leaves stay wet going into the dark. Okay. Um, I'm interested in shade plants that have huge flower impact. Ooh, that's a good one. Okay, one of my favorite little sleepers it's not little, but I love any of the lobelias. Now there are late summer flowering, but they love, there's, there's the cardinal flower and you know, that's lobelia cardinalis. And then it's, it's blue cousin is lobelia syphilitica's bad name, but um, in it's blue and they get spikes. They get spikes about 24 to 36 inches tall really good impact. Um, some of the other ones, some of the big hostas with, um, you know, with, with, the, with variegated foliage, then they also get white flowers, you know, the flower spikes. My favorite is Blue Angel. Oh, I love Blue Angel. And it's a mid-season bloomer with these wonderful white, white spikes. Any of the astilbes, any of the astilbes give great flower impact. Um, some of the, uh, um, okay, oh, there's so many wonderful perennials for the shade. Um, I just told someone about an incredible book, and it's one of, the, it's one of my favorites. It was one of the first books that, it was the first book that Pam Duthie, who is from Northbrook, she wrote a book called Continuous Bloom, and it is phenomenal. It's, 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 it's categorized, all the perennials are categorized by month of bloom. And in, it, it has the, the, the shortest flowering ones at the beginning of the chapter going to the longest flowering. So I tell people, go to the back of the chapter or the month where you want to increase you know, your, your, your show of flowers. And she has sun and shade and then go backwards because fall in love with the ones at the back because they bloom the longest. And, and uh, you can still get the book I think on Amazon, and it, but that's an excellent source. And then she has these wonderful appendixes, appendix, I guess they're called appendices in the back. My favorite is all of the listing of all the different astilbes based on color and based on bloom time. So if you really wanna you know, make your shade garden just dazzle, get an early season astilbe, I get the same color. I like the white ones because it really draws attention into a shaded area. Go with the early blooming white, mid-season white, and late season. I get three of each plant. And I put an early, in the, all of, uh, uh, scattered throughout the garden, and three of them. Then I do a mid-season scattered near each, the, uh, and then in the late season. And you can trick yourself and then trick your friends into thinking that you had those white astilbes blooming all summer long. And so that's one of my favorite, you know, things to do. So follow that trick, and you'll be amazed, and that will give you that wonderful. Um, huge flower impact. Okay, how long does it take for a newly planted grass seed to deepen to the color of the existing lawn? Oh, that's a good question. Um, usually it takes, um, they germinate, they germinate and it's a, it's a pale green. And then it takes them two weeks to get established where the roots get established. And then two weeks later, so I would say four weeks from the time that you put the seed down, it's gonna, it's gonna green up and, and be the same color you know, of, of the existing lawn. Okay, great question. That, that's, that was a fun question. Okay, um, is it time to treat for grubs? Ooh, I like that. If so, what product do you recommend? Okay, now in the years past, in the years past, we used to always use a product and it was the old grub X. Now there's a new grub X. Okay. The two active ingredients that I'm talking about here are um, imidic wait, I get this right, imidacloprid and then and then and then chlor chlorantraniloprol. Okay, so the old one only lasted eight weeks. So we said don't treat with that grub killer until the second week of July, because it would only last till the, the you want to last till the second week of, of September. Now the new grub X, which is phenomenal. And what's neat about it is it has no 
cautionary label on it at all because it only kills six different insects and the, the two different grubs and the Japanese beetle grub and the annual white grub um, and then billbug and oh gosh I, I'm just oh it's only five billbug chinch bug and then the other one we don't have in the area okay so so you can put that down any time from the first of April and it lasts all the way through till December and What's great about it is it's not an insecticide. Oh, my phone wasn't turned off. Oh, how bad, how bad. <gasps> excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And okay, there, I got it turned off. That was tacky. Okay, so back to chlorantrinilopril. Okay, that's what's in the current Grubex. And it works on the calcium ports of the muscles of the grubs. So if they crawl through it and ingest it, or if they inhale it through, they, have, they don't have noses, they have holes on the sides of their bodies called spiracles, and then they, 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 they breathe that in, and then it causes the calcium ports in their muscles to open up, and all the calcium floods out, and they're paralyzed. So they stop doing damage, they stop eating the roots of the grass, they stop doing damage. Unfortunately, it doesn't kill them right away. So if you've got animals that are digging for them, they'll continue to dig and to dig them up. So you might need a repellent too, but that product is phenomenal. And it's the only product that we have out there that doesn't have a, you know, a warning label on it. So like on here, this is caution. So there's caution, danger, you know, caution, warning, or danger are the, are the labels. Pardon me, <coughs> pardon me. And this doesn't have even one warning on it. So that's Grubex. So do it now, do it now. But the annual white grubs and the Japanese beetle scrubs are just coming to the surface. And they're probably pupating right now. They pupate and they stay as pupa for two to three weeks, then they emerge as the adults. So the annual white grub comes out as the June beetle, that little brown June beetle. And then the Japanese beetle come out as Japanese beetles, usually the second week of, of July. Excuse me, I have a tickle. <coughs> I'm so sorry. <coughs> I talk too much. Okay, now, um, what to do about voles in the garden? Okay, mole max. Mole max is the best thing to use. It's based on castor oil. And you sprinkle it over the soil where you're seeing the vole problems. And voles are bad because they leave trails in, uh, in, the, in the lawn that look like dead grass, okay? If it's, if, it's, if it's moles, they're mounded kind of trails, mounded trails, and they're, they're, they're elevated up through the lawn. Voles, they just, you know, they just chew through the thatch and the roots of the, the grass, so you have these trails. So you're going to use the Molmax, sprinkle it closest to the house for a 10 foot, a 10 foot wide band and water it in. Wait three days, three to five days. And then what's happening is it's changed. The voles, if they're in that area, they move out. They move away from your house. Then do another 10 foot band and then, and then wait three to five days and they move out and, you know, and go further. And you want to just force them out of your yard. And then that product stays in the yard for a whole quarter. That, that's, that's, uh, that's three whole months. So it really does the trick. It really does the trick and, get, and gets rid of them. Okay, my boxwoods, after the bad freeze a couple of years ago, are partially dead and some other eyes are still um, alive and green. Will they come back? Please advise. Okay, um, that hard freeze that we had last year. It was last year we had a, that polar vortex where we were uh, 27 degrees. No, we were actually 29 that, the day before, and we dropped down to 29 below. And what happened was any of the plants that were next to warm walls that had the winter sun reflecting off of them or were close to concrete walkways or concrete driveways where they got that reflective warm up. And so they had, they had thawed uh, water in their leaves when that temperature dropped so abruptly, all that water refroze and damaged, killed, killed them all. If they didn't come back after last summer, they're not going to come back. And Tony Fulmer is so funny. He always swears he's going to get t-shirts and sell them that say dead is dead. <laughs> so if it's dead, it's dead, you know. So, so, so make sure it's just that. Make sure it's not what I showed you at the beginning where it's the, the insect problem, the leaf miner problem. So bring a sample in. I can put it on the microscope and I can tell you exactly what it is. Okay, um, okay, here we go. Um, can you use Immunox on milkweed plants or bee balm? Mm. 
Okay, I would not use it on milkweed plants because it's a systemic and it, um, well, let me, hold on, hold on, hold on. Immunox is a systemic fungicide. So yes, you can use that. It has a contact insecticide though that really only lasts for about 24 hours. So if it's before the butterfly season, which you could get by with it now, it's not a problem because that, that contact insecticide uh, will dissipate within 24 hours. So, but they, the Immunox stays in for 14 days. So you asked about using it on milkweed and bee balm, uh, and you're, you're trying to control against powdery mildew on both, I'm sure. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think, I don't think I'd even, powder, milkweed doesn't get powdery mildew too much. So, oh my gosh, I should have muted this. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm muting it now. Shame on me, shame on me. Okay, I apologize. All right, so um, a bee balm gets powdery mildew so so badly that you know I'd go ahead and use that. But to be safe, because of the because of the insects, it's an insect food. Uh, I would I would use the copper fungicide. This is the concentrate. But we also have it in a ready use spray bottle, and you know that'll do the trick for the for the, the powdery mildew. And just spray once a week, and, and that would really take care of it. Good question. It's a good question. Conscientious question. Uh, especially if you're, you know, taking care of the, the butterflies, you know, and the pollinators. Okay, also, okay, some leaves on my lemon tree are yellowing. Any idea why? Yeah. Okay, now, if you had lemons on it, then you're, they're robbing Peter to pay Paul. So you have to make sure you give it a really good fertilizer. I love the Dynagrow. I use the Dynagrow on my lemon. And then the other thing is lemons like it very acidic. They like their soil very acidic. So our water is really alkaline. And so if you're watering just with regular water every week, then you're, you have alkaline soil. So if you wanna keep it acidic, the easiest way to do it and the safest way is just for one gallon of water, you use one cup of black coffee, no cream, no sugar, and that's liquid coffee. Pour it into the gallon with your fertilizer, the Dynagrow, it's one cap of the Dynagrow. Oh, I didn't bring that with me. It's one cap full, it's a half a teaspoon. And then water with that, you will be amazed how the lemons perk back up and the lemon leaves and plants. And you know, get it outside if you can. Um, they do so much better with outdoor, you know, outdoor living in the summertime with our high humidity and, and the direct sun. And they, they recover and they store enough energy that can get through the wintertime, produce the lemons, and then start all over again. So, okay, okay. I planted peas in a pot. The pot flooded with the rain. Would the peas sprout or were they washed away? No, they didn't get washed away. They're probably just over on the edges of the pot. So they'll sprout and come up, you know, come up there. How long, how long will it take? Uh, usually peas, they're a cool season crop. So they usually sprout, and I should have a packet of peas in front of me before I say, I, I think they, those seeds sprout in seven to 10 days. Now, what, what can happen is, um, you know, if, if, the, if the, the seed covering doesn't split and the water doesn't get into the seed, it takes them longer. So it's always fun to just, I like to put my seeds into a, 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 like a metal can with some coarse sand in it, and I shake it really hard, so it roughs up the seed coat. So then when you plant, then the, the water can penetrate that seed coat more easily. So that's kind of a neat trick I always do. All right, so, um, a boxwood, okay, boxwood diseases. The boxwood disease is called volutella stem blight. And a lot of people are panicked because they hear that word blight, and they think it's the blight that has come in from England. And we've been dealing with, uh, it's also called a volutella stem canker boxwood stem canker. Those are all the common names of it. And they can call, cause yellow sections in, you know, in the boxwood. And it's a warm season fungus. It's active in warm season. And so it, what, what the problem with our boxwood is they, they have such tight branching angles that in the wintertime when snow falls on them, those, those, ang those crotches can get cracked. And then, um, and, and then the fungus can get into it. So and again, Immunox is one of the best things you can use to prevent that. So spray the plants with Immunox. Uh, you can also use, I love this for boxwood because it helps protect against the boxwood, the two insects that bother the boxwood, the leaf miner and the psyllid. We've, we've dealt with the psyllid for 
the 30 years. And then, um, then this protects against the boxwood um, stem canker or the, or the volutella stem canker. And you have, a, you have a great fertilizer, a 914-9, so that's high phosphorus for good rooting. Then it has a systemic insecticide and the systemic fungicide. And so you mix that, you use the shrub recommendation inside the label back here. And see, I always talk about that and I never show you how this peels open. You know, this peels open and it has all the magic inside and all the insider secrets. And so you open this up and then it, 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 there's the Spanish version and you have to go back to the English version. And, oh darn it, these are these labels that are supposed to reseal and they just get stuck. Okay, now here we go, here we go. And so you can see right here, it tells you all the different recommendations, you know, on, on how to use it. And then it tells you how to, there, these are all the recommendations. So, oh gosh, that's my measuring cup. So it's for roses, flower beds, and shrubs, shrubs, okay? So the box we're using, the shrub recommendation, it's one ounce per foot of plant height, and in a quart of water. Most boxwoods are four feet tall, so you're gonna do four ounces. There's the four ounce mark right there. Add that to one gallon, that's four quarts. And you're gonna pour this right down the middle of the plant because you're drenching the root collar. And it's gonna stay in for six weeks, get to help fertilize it so it'll grow, protect it against those insects, and also protect it against the, that stem blight. So, so, and it actually works against the bad, the, the bad blight too. So I just like doing all my boxwoods with this. Okay, now, what's the most attractive way to fill an 18 by 30 raised bed with vegetables and herbs? An attractive way? Okay, um, okay, well, all right. What you can do, what you can do is I love, I love a great basil called Pesto Perpetuo. And it's more of an upright and it has green and white variegated leaves. So I'll put those like on the corners of my, of my garden bed because it gives you kind of, kind of like stanchions. And then, um, and, and then you want to add some flowering plants. So I put some marigolds in to help, you know, help repel the, um, you know, any of the, the rabbits. And then nasturtiums and let those cascade over the edges. I like to do colorful thymes in there so they cascade over the edge of the raised bed. And then your tomatoes are gorgeous especially when they have the, and they have the fruit. And, you know, I like to use the smaller, um, the plants that are designed for like container gardening because they don't take as much space up in a small raised bed. That's an 18, is this 18 feet? It didn't come through 18 feet by 30 feet. I bet it is 18 by 30 feet, maybe 18 by 30 inches. No, that's too small. Anyway, um, that, that would give you a very attractive, you know, vegetable garden. Okay, now I want to reinvigorate our backyard bed, which faces north, as well as the beds that face south. Um, you have poor drainage. Well, I talked about the, uh, the clay soil um, perfecter. Use that. Add um, any of the uh, either leaf mulch, the chalet leaf mulch, or the cotton burr compost. So you're adding organic matter. You're getting good, good, um, good, good drainage and, you know, aeration. And that will really reinvigorate you know, those planting beds. Also, you know, give, you know, use some of the Dr. Earth fertilizers on them because when you put that down, it's organically based um, from the fish waste industry. So you've got lots of really natural occurring calcium in it. And then it also has the micronutrients and it lasts 60 days. So one application is good for two whole, you know, two whole months. I'm checking the time. Oh good, we're about 10, in, in 10, 10 minutes away from the deadline here. Um, I, I, I reached the end of my printed questions. Let me, let me check these other ones. I'm gonna go backwards. Oh, I answered that. How do I care for my voodoo plant? Okay, Patty, I, I answered that. You must have come on late. Okay, uh, did I miss the garden mulch question? This is from Amy. Uh, also, how do we get information on garden fountain, fountains? Uh, well, the best way to get information on garden fountains is come to visit and, and, and look at them. And, um, and, you know, we have them on display here. Um, if you can't do that, uh, we, we were doing uh, like virtual tours with, um, with uh, what do we call that from, a, it's called FaceTime on, on an iPhone. And so, you know, you can, you can schedule one of, uh, one of those. Uh, let me go up here again and see if I can scan. Oh, hold on. I'm going to scan up here. Oh, here we go. 
Okay, we have a young weeping willow planted about three weeks ago. It's now getting yellow leaves and are just, are they dropping us? Hey, what could cause this? Oh, okay, now I mentioned this earlier. Whenever you plant a new plant, the first thing that takes over are the roots. So when you plant a new plant, it's the roots are growing and the roots are hogging all the nutrients. They're taking the nitrogen and the phosphorus. And so what they're doing is, you know, they're, they're actually growing. And it, it, to help that, use a transplanting solution like Root and & Grow. And it has that 4103 fertilizer. And so then it will help balance and, you know, it balances. So they're not going to rob Peter to pay Paul and you're not going to lose as many, many leaves. So keep it well watered and also keep it well, you know, the, with the transplanting solution. I like recommending that you do that every two weeks for four times as the roots are growing into the surrounding soil. Good, 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 good question. Okay, I came in late. Uh, can you email the info? Uh-oh, mail quit unexpectedly. Oh, that's not good. I don't know what that means. Okay, here we go. Reopen. I'm reopening the mail. Oh, look, it worked. Okay, hold on. Here we go. I'm going to try to go back. Oh, no. Now what did I do? Uh-oh. Let's go over. Oh, look, here it is. Okay. Nope, that's not it. Uh-oh, I blew it. Hold on, you guys. I'm going to get back there. I went the wrong direction. Okay, where is this? This Zoom. Okay, here we go. Here we go. No, that's not it. Uh-oh, where's my monitor? I think I blew it, you guys. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not a, I'm not an, uh, an, an Apple person. So um, let me go back over here. And it's got to be down here. If I scroll across this, maybe it's going to pop back up. Oh, this is embarrassing. Hold on, everybody. Oh, there we go. Are we back up again? Oh, that's FaceTime. Where's the Zoom thing? Okay, here's Zoom. Oh, I'm back. Hi, everybody. Could you see me while I was doing that whole time? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, so now let's go back up here. I'm going to move this thing down. Okay, let's move this down. Oh, there we go. Oh, look, now I can actually work it. Oh, I'm so sorry. You must think I'm a goofball. Okay, here we go. How do I care? Did I miss garden? Okay, we have a young weeping willow. Oh, I just answered that. Here we go. Do you have any jasmine or anthurium not blooming in now? We do. We just got the jasmine and we actually have anthuriums, you know, in. So, you know, come in and take a look. Peonies, we do have peonies. Uh, we have a young weeping willow planted about three weeks ago. It's now getting yellow leaves. Oh, I just did that. Oh, you did it twice. Okay. Okay, what could be causing that? Well, I talked about that. All right, and let me make sure. I'm going to scroll down again to see if I've got everybody. Here we go, here we go. Oh, I think I think I did it. You all have been absolutely fabulous. So um, be sure and stay tuned to our um, our emails and watch for the one watch for the one about the farm truck. And even if you're not going to buy anything from the farm truck, have fun watching us up at, at at the farm. It was beautiful up there today, and I was we, we were in all the different. Um, the, the Quonset huts where the plants live over the winter have all been uncovered. And then I was actually out in some of the, the open beds where the, the perennials are. It is just, it's beautiful up there. It's absolutely lovely. And we were up there. I've got up there at um, 7.30 and then we filmed until, until 8.30. And, uh, and we just had a great time and we missed the rain. We didn't get any rain. Uh, I got rain when I was driving back to come back to, you know, to work here at the retail store. So um, I'm going to go ahead and, and I, I think I've got about three minutes left. And I just want to thank you all so much. I'm getting wonderful thank yous um, on the chat. You know, thank you for a wonderful time. You know, thank you. Thank you all for tuning in. Spread the word. We're going to do this. We're going to do this every week. And, um, and I'll, I'll answer as many questions as I can. If there were some late entries for the questions, don't worry. We have your email. I'll send you the answer directly, okay? So if you didn't get any airtime, don't worry. I'll send you the answers. We're, we're getting organized about this, and, um, and we're making it work. So thank you for sticking with us through this, uh, through this um, COVID time. And, uh, and you know, we're all, we're all, we'll all make it. But we're all going to make it. So thank you so much, and, um, and um, stay tuned, all right? Bye, everybody.